memories light the corners of my mind misty water colored memories of the way we were Hello once again and welcome to A Family Story, William and Catherine's Children. I'm Bill Mahar and this is the second effort to share family history. As the title suggests, we will look at the children of William and Catherine Mahar namely Joanna, Ralph, Fred, and adopted daughter Sadie Major. They represent the parents of some of you and the grandparents to those of my generation. Most of the photographs presented here were not available to me when I was working on the previous DVD, so only a few items are repeats. Where the pyre DVD dealt with investigating little-known early family history, this effort deals more with the lives of dear people with whom we've had actual first-hand relationships, have more detailed information, as well as many more photographs. Once again, I'd like to thank those who have tolerated my questions, helped identify people in numerous pictures, and who have supplied fascinating information and stories. What follows is certainly not a definitive account of these people's lives, but rather a very brief exploration of information and images that may not be well known to most viewers. Take care and farewell for now. This presentation will focus on William and Catherine Mahar's three children, Joanna, Ralph, Fred, and adopted daughter Sadie Major. Over the past several months, a number of interesting photographs of the four and their families have been accumulated, so there is sufficient material for a presentation featuring them. As a refresher, William Maher married Catherine Hansen in February 1886. This is William and Catherine's wedding picture. William and Catherine had four children, Joanna standing in the center, Ralph standing far right, Fred standing far left, and a son who died at birth on June 3, 1901, plus a foster daughter, Sadie Major, seated between William and Catherine. Joanna, the oldest child, was born January 27, 1888. This is the earliest picture we have of Joanna, along with Fred on the left and Ralph next to Joanna. This is what Ralph Mahar says about Joanna's birth, as read by Don Mahar. You understand that this would be the voice of Ralph Mahar. Okay. I was born on my dad's homestead near Elwood, Nebraska, on November the 17th, 1889, and it was in a house made of lumber. My oldest sister, Dodie, Josie was her real name, was born in a dugout, which was a sod house built into the side of a hill on the same farm. Joanna attended the Wilkieville School. This is the Wilkieville School, but the date of this photo and the subjects are not known. The school was near the Mahar homestead. This newspaper photo of the school taken in 1909 describes the location of the school. Joanna graduated from high school and then taught at the Wilkieville School. Joanna is on the far right and may have been taken when she was a teacher. It's evident that the Mahars were friends of the Majors since William and Catherine took in Sadie. 
Here we have Fred Maher and Jim Major in a sports car of the day. Jim was a brother of Sadie and Ernest. Ernest Major appears in several pictures with Fred and William. Ernest on the left and Fred on the right as jaunty young gentlemen with their fine cigars. Joanna married Ernest Major on January 9, 1908. Cleora Major was the oldest of the three major children, born November 16, 1908. She is pictured here with her great-grandparents Eliza and Nicholas Hansen. Baby Cleora with her parents in the front seat. Back seat has Catherine Mahar, Sadie Major, and the boy and girl are not known. The Overland pennant on the side of the car may very well represent the model of car they are setting in. Overlands were produced in Indianapolis from about 1903 to 1926. Taken at the L. O. Seget Studio in Lexington, Nebraska, a family portrait with Joanna, Cleora, Virgil, and Ernest about 1919. Virgil was born February 21st, 1919, and Harold was born July 20th, 1922. The Majors moved to Montana and homesteaded a ranch there around 1930 near the town of Ekalaka, which is approximately 30 miles straight west of the border between North and South Dakota. We know that 1929 marked the collapse of the American economy known as the Great Depression and lasted until about 1939 or around the beginning of World War II. It was also the beginning of the Dust Bowl, or the Dirty Thirties, which was a period of severe dust storms, causing major ecological and agricultural damage to American and Canadian prairie lands from 1930 to 1936. Life was certainly not easy anywhere in the Plains states. In the first DVD, we mentioned that we have a real-life cowboy in our family, that being William. Well, we have a real-life cowgirl in our family also. This is Joanna on their Montana ranch. Taken on the Montana ranch probably in the early 1930s is Virgil, Ernest, and Harold. On the far left, we have real horsepower versus mechanical horsepower on the far right. A photo taken near their Montana house, we have Joanna, Harold, and Ernest. Harold was eight when the family moved to Montana, so this was likely taken in the early 1930s. The major family taken in 1960. From left to right is Virgil, Cleora, Harold, Joanna, and Ernest. Joanna was a tall lady at six feet, but she was the shortest of the siblings. Joanna and Ernest made a rich life on the eastern Montana prairie. Joanna was known to neighbors as Mrs. Major or Grandma Major. Ernest was known to the community as E.A. He passed away on September 23, 1970. Ralph was born November 17, 1889. Pictured here on the far right with his brother Fred and father William, taken in 1897. Both Ralph and Fred attended the Wilkieville School and are listed as students on this 1903 student list. 
You will also note that William was a board member. Let's hear what Art and Don recall about their father's education. Now, how much schooling, Arthur, there would you say that uh, Dad had? Now, in those well, days, they just kind of went to school as they had time, was that yeah, it? Yeah, that Dad was supposed to have completed the eighth grade, but it was... Uh, they didn't hold school too long a time, and then their, the teachers were not too competent either, and then the schools were so large. There were maybe 25 kids in the school there, and uh, there was eighth grades. So well, then the teacher couldn't give any of them too much uh, uh, attention, you know. And then, of course, the boys got bigger than the teacher then pretty soon. Yeah, and, and of course, then also when the corn shucking time come, why the, all of the boys that were able to... Uh, would uh, go out and shuck corn, you know. And another thing in those days, Dennis, that these school teachers, a lot of them would come from the cities and come out into the country and teach school, and about invariably they married a farm boy, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. It wasn't this now Uncle Fred and Gertie was a school teacher, wasn't yeah, I think she was. Right? Although she wasn't from too far away. No, no. She was a school teacher, and Uncle Fred married a school teacher, but this happened so often that... Ralph married Mabel Smith on April 25, 1911. This is a honeymoon photo taken in Denver, Colorado. The Smiths were also friends of the Mahars, and my grandmother's album had a number of pictures of the Smith family. Ralph's oldest children were Art and Don, shown here in 1914. Ralph and Mabel lived for a time in this sod house near Elwood, Nebraska. They later moved to the Bush Place and the Whaley Place, both near Lexington, Nebraska. Then into Lexington and after that to the Rosencrantz Place on the creek south of the Mahar Homestead. Ralph and Mabel had six children. One child, Chester, died in infancy. Per Jenny Erickson, Chester passed away during the bad flu epidemic in 1919 from pneumonia. There was a blizzard when he was sick and the doctor could not get to the farm. This is believed to be Chester in the chair with Dawn on the left and Doris on the right. A family portrait with Mabel, Doris, Art, Ralph and Don, probably taken in the early 1920s. Ralph moved the family to Oregon in September 1937, first to Estacada and in 1940 to Vernonia. Jenny recalls that move. 1967, and Mother had come to uh, San Francisco to she wanted very much to see her first grandchild. This Ted was a little Teddy was born in 1937 in January. And she got a ride with one of her sisters to California. And when she got to San Francisco, she didn't want to go back because that was the time of the depression and the drought. There was nothing really to go back. So she wrote to Dad read this letter out in the field and the grasshoppers were eating the onions out right out of the ground. And so he decided that the sweet goes. So he loaded in the rain and the rain was 11 and I was 15. He loaded us in the old Nash. And what he put in there, I don't know. <laughs> I know we had a radio and we had a little dog, a little bulldog. And, uh, he had a sack of potatoes that were about the size of walnuts, but he brought them anyway. And uh, we headed for uh, San Francisco, and it took us five days. And I, I, we, Lorraine and I don't have good memories, or don't have memories. I don't know if we shut him out or what. But I do know that we stayed one night in a motel. It was $15 a night. We took a shower and had clean clothes when we got to San Francisco. <laughs> oh, so that was quite a memory. 
1938 photo of Jenny, Lorraine, and the little Boston Bulldog, Ginger, in Estacada, Oregon. Staying there. Wanted to, mother had kind of wanted to go to Oregon. She had heard good things about Oregon, so that's why we didn't stay in the vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a Napa Valley person. Yeah. So had, had no job or anything, just he headed no west. Job, and he was 48 years old. See, it's, it's always amazed me how many people from Nebraska, you know, went westward to the land of opportunity with, with you know, just a vision it that was. it was going to be there. Right, and that was before the war, you know, uh -huh. so that there weren't the jobs in 1937. But he found a job in a chippo logger in Estacada. Hmm. We rented a house for $100 a year. Well, it was a big old house. It's still a lot there. Uh -huh. I think they have indoor plumbing now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the house is still there? Uh -huh. Oh, that was that's a nice awesome. old sturdy house. Uh -huh. This photo was in an old family album. Ted Grice believes that this was a truck that Ralph bought shortly after World War II for $600 from a Mr. Schrick, who was a used equipment dealer in Vancouver. Ted recalls riding the truck with his grandfather. Early in my email conversations with Jenny, she recalled an old phonograph. In a moment, you will hear Don Mahar and Esther Smith's recollection about the same phonograph. So it is evident that it made quite an impression on several members of the family. Apparently, Ralph got it from his parents' attic and took it home for the kids to play with. As far as we can reconstruct its history, Ralph apparently gave the phonograph to my dad just before his move to Oregon. My dad, in turn, gave it to me. You'll hear Don say that it was in pretty rough shape, and when I got it, it certainly was. It was full of dirt and grease, the belt that turned the cylinder was long gone, and the tube records weren't in much better shape. I cleaned it up, handmade a leather belt, and the phonograph worked. It has been in this same bookcase in our house for close to 40 years. We were just talking to Aunt Esther about something my dad had when he was younger. Antique. An antique along with these old cars was one of the real old... Uh, see, was this an Edison or, or Vic, Vic Trola? It was Vic Trola. Yeah, because it's the one that had the dog on it that says my master's voice. Wasn't it? This was the tube type. You know, the records went on a on a roller. And I can remember, oh, I suppose back when maybe I was uh, 10, 11 years old, we went up to, to the old place and up in this attic with all these old relics that my grandmother had. Yeah. There was a little steam engine that my dad had as a when he was a boy. Mm -hmm. And let's see, there was a few other things. But anyway, we brought these home, and there was some old straight razors and a few things like that. We brought these home, and my folks, instead of saying, let's put this stuff up and let it become an antique, he let us kids play with it, and you know how boys are. It wasn't long until my mm -hmm. was not realizing it's the antique that it was. Why? The steam engine got worn out, and the mm -hmm. photograph got worn out, and, and because uh, that extra thought here, maybe that my 